ברוכים הבאים. ‫הסמנה המחלתי של מרכז מלטון ‫לחינוך חיובי. We are very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Karen Neal. Um, and if I can use this opportunity to request that anybody who would like to either put their telephones on um, or to close them, you're invited to do so. Um, um, Dr. Karen Schneer Neal is with us at the Melton Center from Florida Atlantic University. She is a senior Fulbright scholar. She directs a storytelling project at, their, at that university where she teaches storytelling. Um, in addition to the fact that she has um, researched, written, and taught a lot about storytelling, she also has a very rich background in Bible and Jewish studies. Um, and uh, we have used this opportunity that Dr. Neal is with us to invite her to speak in a series of different uh, arenas to different audiences. And um, some of them uh, will work. Um, we don't yet have too much control over the students' work for what we're working on. But um, those groups with whom Karen has met until now have been very, very enthusiastic about her presentation, and therefore uh, we're very pleased that you're able to join us for this short period of uh, three weeks. And um, we look forward to hearing your remarks, and afterwards we will open up the uh, uh, session for discussion and comments. And afterwards, anybody who would like to set a meeting with Karen during the short time that she's here, um, is invited to do so. As uh, she just mentioned to me a few minutes ago, her schedule is very, very quickly filling up. Um, but we really see this as an opportunity to establish a relationship with you and to see where this goes beyond uh, these three weeks. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to begin by saying <coughs> that I cannot say enough how welcome I felt here by all the faculty and administration and staff and people I've met in restaurants and bus drivers and taxi drivers. I haven't been in this country for 30 years and I was very hesitant about what kind of response, I'm just concerned about what kind of response <coughs> I would get and you have all made me feel so much at home and I appreciate that very much. I'm going to start with a little story. I knew you'd expect that from me, so let's just get it out of the way. <laughs> you may very well know this story. It's an old Jewish uh, folk tale from the 11th century. <coughs> There's a nobleman who is uh, riding his horse through the countryside. He has just come from an archery contest uh, that he has won. Hands down, he is the finest archer in the entire area. And he comes upon a barn. On that barn are drawn maybe a hundred targets. And in the book, just the circles within circles within circles within circles. And on every bullseye, there is an arrow hole. And he is absolutely astonished that there could be an archer better than he. So he looks around to see who could be this gaon, this incredible archer. And he sees on the other side of the barn, there is a little boy painting circles around holes. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, uh, I'm kind of attempting to do that with this talk because I called my talk, Why Storytelling? and left it that vague specifically so that I could see what would work this week and what wouldn't work this week and what I could present. So partly I am doing the, I am drawing the holes first, partly I'm looking to see where the, um, uh, I'm, I'm getting the arrow in the, in the bullseye hopefully, so it's a little bit of both. Now 
if I were teaching anthropology in an anthropology department, or for that reason, for that matter, education in an education department, I would talk theory completely for the whole 40, 45 minutes. Because my field is so, at such an interdisciplinary field par excellence, uh, for me to talk theory, I would be bringing in anthropology, and I would be bringing in linguistics, and I would be bringing in performance studies, and I would be bringing in rhetoric and everything else. And I think that might be less valuable to you than if I introduce you to, just in general to what storytelling studies is, to what storytelling is, to what the storytelling world is a little bit, to what storytelling studies is, to why I'm in the, I was hired, in fact, why they created a position for me in the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies at Florida Atlantic University. And then to get, just, just do a little bit of theory, just so that you would see the kinds of things that I teach, and then to take your questions. Does that sound okay? Yeah. So first of all, uh, just to add a little bit uh, to Howie's uh, excellent introduction, I am artist in residence, uh, full-time faculty in the School of Communication and Multimedia Studies at Florida Atlantic University. We have six or seven campuses, depending on how you count, throughout South Florida. I teach at three of them. My office is at the main campus in Boca Raton. Probably many of you either have parents or know people who have parents in that area. I'm the only person I know of who doesn't. Uh, have parents in that area, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, I also teach uh, uh, further south in, in uh, near Fort Lauderdale area and then further north in, in Jupiter as well. My campus is there. I am not a tenure track scholar, and uh, I'll get into that a little bit more. That is by choice because of what I would not be able to do as a tenure track person. I, I uh, have decided that it makes more sense for me not to be. Uh, I've been teaching at the university four years now. I got a degree from that university, and I know how unusual it is, not only for a university to then hire somebody who is a graduate, but also for them to create a position for someone who's a graduate, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. My background is that I was in the Jewish um, Theological Seminary Columbia joint program uh, after Young Judea year course. Uh, I was a student of Ed Greenstein, among many others. In fact, I spent Shabbat with him in Beverly, and uh, this past Shabbat. And then I went into the U.S. Peace Corps. Some of you may be familiar with that. So I have a very strong interest in social action. Uh, my uh, undergraduate degree from the seminaries in Hebrew uh, literature and Jewish education, and then at Columbia, it's from uh, is in literature and writing. And then I did an MFA at Florida International University, where Stanley Fish is, you may, you may know that name. I just found out he moved there, decided not to go to my university, went there. I got an MFA there in creative writing. But all along, I had been doing storytelling work as a student <coughs> teacher, uh, as a teacher um, once I had the MFA, as, a, as an adjunct professor. And in virtually everything I've done, I did storytelling without recognizing uh, to the last decade or so, what I was doing, that this was a field, and that this was something that could be so useful in education, social action, and in a, in a large uh, uh, area of interest. So then I went back to school for a PhD in a, a very unusual program, a brand new program when I entered the school, which was called the uh, Public Intellectuals Program, obnoxious name, I know. It was written up in the Chronicle for Higher Education. I was interviewed by Der Zeit when, when they, uh, in German, uh, when they, is that how you pronounce it, Der Zeit? Uh, in Germany, when they launched the program with a, an unusual philosopher from Australia who designed it, and absolutely the creme de la creme of people in the university. One of the lovely things about being in South Florida is even though we're a state university, we get magnificent scholars because everybody wants to live there. So people accept a little bit less cachet in exchange for the lifestyle, the sunshine, and, and everything else. So I had a sensational education and an interdisciplinary program. My PhD is in comparative studies, which has nothing to do with comparative literature, 
Uh, it's an interdisciplinary program in the humanities and the social sciences. Uh, so you may say I'm a jack of all trades and expert in nothing except storytelling studies. The idea of this program was not, in fact, to churn out more university professors, but to provide a theoretical underpinning to social activists. So my area of interest within the program was creative strategies for social action. So I use storytelling studies, particularly with respect to conflict resolution, conflict prevention, tolerance building. So I do work a lot of intergenerational work because there are a lot of uh, senior citizens, as you can imagine, in South Florida. So I do a lot of that. I do a lot of tolerance building because we have many different groups. We have many Haitians, many Cubans, um, many uh, Colombians, etc., in the area. And of course, many people who just don't get along. So that's a very quick uh, overview, just so that you know a little bit about where I'm coming from. OK, storytelling. One of the first definitions, if not the first definition of storytelling in many English dictionaries is lying, which is a wonderful place to start. I like to say, are you familiar with the comedian Rodney Dangerfield? Some of you. Rodney Dangerfield, who was a Jewish comic who just recently died, his catchphrase was, I get no respect. And I like to say that storytelling in general is the Rodney Dangerfield of activities because either we are identified with lying or we are identified with small children uh, sitting on the floor as a librarian reads a picture book or as a parent reads a picture book. And, and for better or for worse, I would argue for worse, we do not respect people in, that, in our society, and I believe here as well, we don't respect people who work with children as, uh, as much as we do with people who certainly who work with, with adults. Uh, storytelling studies certainly tries, on one hand, to give more cachet to that work, and on the other hand, to show that we are so much more than that. But we'll start with, what do I mean by storytelling? What do people in my field mean by storytelling? And I like to refer to the work of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a storytelling coach and a scholar. He's on the board of our journal, to some extent, scholar and per, uh, performer. Most of us have many, many wear many, many hats within storytelling. Doug Lippman, and he gives five characteristics of what we in the field refer to as storytelling. And the first is words. You know, in Hawaii, uh, with the, the hula dance, we say the, hand, the hands tell the story, uh, people who do mime, people who do filmmaking of any kind, people who do um, uh, fine arts, many people refer to themselves as storytellers. The storytelling I'm specifically talking about deals with language, involves language. Uh, also, the imagination. And uh, again, there are some kinds of storytelling <coughs> that rely more or less on that, this, but generally we consider there's some use of the imagination. Narrative, of course. Interaction, which does not have to be direct. When I'm telling you a story, I am instinctively looking, just like any good teacher would, I am instinct instinctively looking for your reactions, your body language, are you looking at your watch, are you looking at where the watch would be if you were wearing one, are you yawning, are you uh, doing whatever. And, oh, by the way, while I'm talking, speaking of body language, I'm going to pass around a few things. Uh, so if you are less or more or less interested, and you've got you've got articles, and you can take a look at. Whoops, I'm glad there was no water in that. You can take a look at these. Uh, so the indirect or direct interaction, and then also nonverbal behavior. So you can see, particularly from these last th uh, two, that being present, being in the same room, 
transmitting energy, being uh, uh, making eye contact, is a huge part of storytelling and a huge part of why I believe that the storytelling we do, I do, and my colleagues do, is so important. There is a difference, as I don't need to tell you, between in, uh, being in a room with somebody and having somebody either read, I mean, online line education is so big in the States, and I'm sure it's, uh, it's growing here as well. There is a difference between being in the same, same room and making eye contact than having somebody read what you've written or, or even listen to a, uh, to a CD or a C watching a DVD of what you've done. And I see that more and more as I go along, and I see the importance of face-to-face -face communication more and more, more and more as I go along. So these five elements are what I mean by uh, storytelling. Now, storytelling studies, which is the term that uh, my colleagues and I have given to what we do, and I, as I say, this is a very new field. It's taught in about 200 colleges and universities throughout the world, and a little over 100, perhaps, in, uh, in the United States. There is a master's in storytelling at East Tennessee State University in uh, Jonesboro, Tennessee, where the revival of storytelling took place. And uh, in, at the Graduate Institute in Connecticut, there's a master's. But generally, people have programs or an individual course. In my case, it is, uh, I, I teach five different classes in storytelling. And my program is called the South Florida Storytelling Project. I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to do a certificate program, a graduate certificate program. I've been given the green light to do it. And some of you may think, well, don't be crazy. Of course, do it. But there are reasons I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating, which I, uh, perhaps I'll get to. Anyway, so storytelling is taught, storytelling studies is taught in schools of education, in uh, library science departments or schools, in folklore, certainly, in uh, performance studies and theater to some extent. Uh, and, and so there is, a, a, again, this strong interdisciplinary sense. But, peop and I should say, because of that, and because most people do not have interdisciplinary PhDs as I do, most people will focus on their area of expertise, whereas I draw from many. So when I teach, I use rhetoric. I talk about um, how storytelling has a little bit of logos, a lot of pathos, and a lot of ethos, and why those things are so important in, in rhetoric and in persuasion and, and also in education. Uh, I use uh, performance studies, and I'm going to tell you a little bit of um, what a, a performance studies scholar, how he's <coughs> tied together a few things. Richard Schechner, I don't know if any of you know that name. But I use quite a bit of that. And of course, I talk about performance anxiety. And I do a lot with, uh, method with applications of storytelling as well in, uh, with respect to performance studies. I use anthropology. I'm glad our anthropologist came in. Because I wouldn't have said it otherwise. I use folklore. Uh, and I think I brought, yeah, I brought the uh, folklore index uh, I use. In my classes, I might bring in variants, different versions of the same folktale from different eras and different countries, and show people what are the differences and what are the, what are the similar. Show, show students what are the differences and what are the similarities among those those variants as a way of showing that in some ways we are all alike. We work with the same archetypes. And speaking of archetypes, uh, I do. Uh, work with psychology with Jung, and I also do work with, uh, um, also with re respect to uh, archetypes, with mythology, with Campbell's work I talk a lot about. And a little bit on linguistics, which I'll bring in in a little while. And education and communication and, and a lot else. So as I say, not everyone who calls him or herself a scholar in storytelling studies necessarily touches all of these bases. I just happen to have an unusual education and an unusual 
reading background, so I bring in a lot of these things to, to make my points. And also, of course, I just tell stories a lot. Okay, so that's storytelling studies. Uh, any questions so far? Any comments or concerns or suggestions? Or anybody want to stretch? Mm -hmm. All right. So, I want to talk about why they created a position for me in the School of Communication and what it is that I do and uh, get you thinking a little bit about the use of storytelling studies in, uh, th in this country and perhaps in this school because I don't intend to leave after three weeks. I'm just leaving the husband and the dog and the cat behind. I'll have my things sent over to me. All right. One of the things, uh, my load, and please don't let this get out of this room because it's supposed to be a secret. My load at the university is just, yes, I'm in it is It is so amazing what they've, been, they've given me to do, what my boss has given me to do. First of all, I teach two classes, and I decide what classes to teach each semester, what is needed in the, what, what campus. I generally teach a basic storytelling class, and in that class, I do a little bit of, the, of each of these. I touch on a little bit of theory, and I think I'll start there. And uh, then I do a lot of how do you tell a story, what, um, uh, how to get over uh, performance anxiety. Uh, I, I, my students tell two or three stories depending on the class. Um, they, so they learn how to get up and tell a folk tale. They learn what is a folk tale. They learn how to, how to research folk tales. They also learn how to create a personal story and they learn a little bit about the importance. And I think I'll stop there and, tell you, and show you very, very briefly what I might discuss with respect to theory. Can you see this, Seth? Okay. So for example, I might say that there is a human instinctive need for story that in fact many scholars have called human beings homo narens, a storytelling animal. And we see that in many ways. One of the ways we see it is in a, is in a comparison that the great um, um, performance study scholar Richard Schechner, does anybody familiar with that name? That Richard Schechner came up with, uh, who was a protege of uh, Victor Turner, the anthropologist of Victor Turner, so I would, I would expect that you would have heard of him. So uh, Victor Turner, of course, said, that the social drama, the way that societies grow and change, mirrors rites of passage in society. And so he gave a kind of a step-by-step -step, uh, roadmap, to mix metaphors, it's a little bit mixed metaphors, of how that social drama happens. And so what he said is first, there is a breach and you can correct me at any point. First, there is a breach. There is some leaving of the community behind, whether it's to start to study for bar mitzvah in the, in the case of, uh, of uh, a rite of passage, or whether it is some ren rending, uh, some splitting up of the, of the society itself, somebody who's, who goes off from the society and decides to follow a different path. Or, or question the society. Uh, after the breach, there is crisis. I think I may need a different. There is a, a struggle, some sort of some sort of conflict, some sort of, um, of itch that needs to be scratched. In the case of the social drama, it would be something uh, a more more significant than an itch that needs to be scratched some sort of questioning and challenging of the community. Okay? And that would be getting into the, let's say for a rite of passage, that would be really doing the work of studying for bar mitzvah, let's say. Uh, so we have breach and crisis. And then we have some sort of resolution, some sort of, of, of uh, resolution of that crisis. And then we have either the integration back into the community 
of the person who's gone through the rite of passage and of the person of the of the uh, the group in the society that has been rent, or we have a schism. If it does not work, if integration does not work, so this is a very very quick view of an anthropological anthropology, an anthropological scheme. On the other hand, linguistically, researchers named um, Labov and Woleski, and uh, particularly Labov, wrote in the 60s about, uh, they, they, inter they uh, followed did the ethnography and did a lot of work with inner city teenagers, ghetto teenagers, on their narratives, their, the, how they told stories among themselves. And he found that stories always followed a particular step-by-step <coughs> -step process. There were six steps. Four of them were always there. So I'll draw a line around step one and step six, because they, they are not always extant. But the other four are, and, they're, and the steps are always in the same order. The first one that is not always there is an abstract. And the abstract would be, I'm going to tell you the funniest thing that happened today. The funniest thing that ever happened to me happened today. Or I'm going to tell you a scary story. It could be one line. It could be a couple of words. But something to set the mood, to let you know where you're going, that you're not supposed to, to cry at what I'm saying, that you're not supposed to. I'm going to tell you a joke. It's even a very, very uh, vague abstract. Or it could be more specific than that. I want to tell you about the last time I was here at the Hebrew University. Okay. Okay. Then... We have the orientation, which is the setting, characters, the beginning of the story, where we are in the story. This is always in a story. We have conflicting action, the crisis. We have, I'm going to skip this one for a minute, we have the resolution. And then we have, not always, but often, we have the coda, which is just a, and from now, from then on, I was convinced that I would never go back to New York again. Um, so just some line that is not always there, but something that ties up the story and, and, and takes us a little bit forward into, into what's happening past the story. Now this one, this fourth, uh, third, element is very, very interesting, I think. He calls it the evaluate, they call it the evaluation. Always in a story. And the evaluation, you see the word value, the evaluation there is, why should I care? Every story has to have a why should I care. It could be something as simple as, I had intended to make Aliyah, somehow 30 years got away from me, and I'm back in Israel, and, and, and so, I mean, it could be that many lines, that many words, or it could be, instead of being hungry and not getting a, a chance to eat in the story, it could be, I was hungrier than I'd ever been in my life. And then you know why, I, why it was so important for me to get food. Uh, it could be the word very is an evaluation. Something in a story that makes us care. Okay. Now, the hero's journey, and then we get over to the kind of archetype. And I'm not going to go into all the steps of the hero's journey because it's too complicated right now. But the hero's journey, which has been called, um, Joseph Campbell uh, changed his mind after a while before he died, but it was called at one point the monomyth the uh, foundational myth of American culture, this idea of leaving uh, the, the, the Western, the hero of a Western, the cowboy who goes up, cleans up the, uh, the wild west town and then goes off into the sunset, uh, is the hero's journey, the individual who goes off on his own and makes a difference in the society. This beautifully mirrors this, the rite of passage, beautifully mirrors this. Okay, so we pulled together three, he pulled, to, uh, Schechner pulled together, and I extend this a little bit, pulled together three different fields that show us how deeply resonant storytelling is for us on, on, such, a, um, on such a profound level for, for the human psyche. Okay, so that might be something, very, very generally, that might be something that I would teach students.
The other class I've been teaching, and I teach a, a bunch of classes, so that's what I might do in the storytelling class. I also teach a class called Peace, Conflict, and Oral Narrative, which was supposed to be called Peace, Conflict, and Storytelling, but the director of my school felt that just in case somebody else wanted to teach it, we ought to not use the word storytelling in there. We already have classes in my school communication called Conflict and Communication. This is Conflict and Communication, but focusing on the use of storytelling. Uh, anybody who's done conflict resolution work knows that, that or mediation knows that Storytelling is a huge part of that process anyway, but this takes it one step further. And my students do a lot of, uh, of study of peace work, but also there's a, a lot of work that's been done on storytelling and peace. And in fact, I have a, on the International Storytelling Center's website, I have some pages. Um, so there, uh, it's for the public, it's very general but uh, storytellingcenter.net, I have some pages on storytelling for peace, but many people do that work. And while we're at it, I'm just going to give you another website, just to take a little detour here. I'm also on the, I'm a consultant for them, but I'm on a, the board of the Healing Story Alliance. Uh, healing in a very general sense, both um, healing for the, um, healing for people, and healing for the planet. Uh, healing story, excuse me, dot org. And this might be an interesting site for some of you as well. Okay. <coughs> I also teach a class called Social Drama Workshop. You heard about the social drama earlier on. This is a wildly successful class that I teach every spring. Last year I taught it in, in concert with the theater department. And uh, this is an intergenerational class. We bring in eight or ten senior citizens. I do a lot of work with seniors in the community. Perfectly, completely free. Of course, they don't get grades, but they don't pay tuition. They don't even pay for parking. I give them the books and everything. This is based on, just looking to see how we are for time. This is based on the work of a theater troupe. They've been doing this for about 15, about, about 15 years in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, a man named, named Arthur Strimlin, who's a storyteller and also an artistic director of this theater. And the theater company is called Roots and Branches. They bring together seniors in the community with college, and I think the youngest are college students. And w what they do, and if, if it's not clear to you, because I'm, I'm just going to say it in two sentences, I'll be delighted to talk to you about it afterwards if you're interested. They bring together the seniors and the students. They share stories on a theme, and then a, a play based on a classic play, generally. I, I saw them do, what got me interested in this is I saw them do King Lear. Based on a classic play, they fold in, sort of like you're folding in sugar into batter, they, or eggs into batter, they fold in the stories of the seniors, the elders, and the students into that play. So last year, I did Romeo and Juliet, with the class, and a 45, 50 minute version of it, where Romeo was 18 and Juliet, I think, was about 83. And it worked better that way than I thought the other way around. And uh, this year we just did, just two days before I left, we did um, King Lear, which of course you can imagine would be very, very interesting to do. Both of these would be interesting to do intergenerationally. So, and King Lear was a young, young man. So they, they shared stories the first half of the semester on themes of sibling rivalry and themes of uh, retirement and all of these different things. And then they, then, and there's a, a book that Arthur Strimlin wrote that we use, and we use a lot of different material. Okay, so there's that. I am just doing a class now called Writing, Fa just starting in the fall, called Writing Family Story. Uh, family history being, family memory being a, a very important uh, area of folklore. So that's family. And then I also teach a class which, this is all undergraduate, although I, have, I always have graduate students coming in. And then the last one is um, theory of oral narrative in cultural performance. And I did that as an undergraduate class and as a graduate class. So uh, there's a pretty good range. And the next one, that, so these five I teach. And there's one I'm adding next year, which will be a, a performance studies, a straight performance studies class. So that's my teaching. 
I very rarely have trouble getting students in these classes, uh, partly because they think they're going to be sitting listening to stories all day long, mm -hmm. but partly because they love it. They love this stuff. And um, it's not easy. They get very concerned when they come in and look at my syllabus. But they, it, it, it's amazing, the response I've gotten from students. The third part of my load is this journal that we're passing around. Um, I was uh, the founding managing editor of this journal. I've got to say, it is my proudest moment, other than standing here in front of you, it is one of my proudest moments as an academic. We started this journal at a conference at my school in, I think it was 2003 or 2004, I can't remember exactly when it was. You'd think I'd remember when my proudest moment was, but I can't, I can't think right now. We are now in our third year, third volume of the journal. We were bought by Lawrence Earl Baum. A number of people have told me they've, got, they've had the same experience. We were bought after our fourth or fifth issue by Lawrence Earl Baum Associates, and then they were bought by Taylor and Francis. So we will have the Routledge in print as of next year. Uh, this is an international journal. Uh, so far, most of the editorial associates, uh, of course, most of our advisory board are from America. But, um, and most of our contributors are too, but not everyone. And this is a, something we've been doing with people from tennis, uh, univers uh, universities in Tennessee, in Texas, in California, and in different places around the country. So I'm very happy to talk to you about that as well afterwards. There is online, I tried to get a hard copy for you, it's just out. And I would be delighted to send it to anybody who would like when I get back. Mm -hmm. The special issue, we do a special issue each year. We've done so far uh, healing and business, storytelling and healing, storytelling and organizations. The special issue for education, unfortunately, is just out. It's supposed to be online. I meant to check this morning and get a chance. It's supposed to be online as of today. If it is not, I will certainly find out for you. But there are a number of interesting articles. I interviewed, including, uh, it's not exactly a lit review, but it's an interview I did with somebody who was in the midst of, of producing a lit review, uh, a, a PhD who does a lot of this work, uh, has for the last 25 years. And I did an interview with him where we talked about a lot of quantitative research and qualitative research, particularly quantitative research in storytelling and education. So I'd be delighted to share that with you. So that's the third part of my load. And the fourth part of my load, where I will end, is outreach. I told you earlier I, I chose, is my time okay? I chose not to be a, a tenure track. I may regret this, but I don't think so. Because outreach, because I did not go straight through as an academic, I had time off in between, but also because I am as an activist that, to some extent, I wanted to do a lot of work in the community. So I do outreach with seniors, with the, the elderly. I do a lot of work in schools. So I was delighted to be able to work yesterday at Beit Sefer Yitzhak Rabin in Modi'in. I did a, a ninth grade English language class there yesterday with uh, work with storytelling. I do a lot in libraries. I do a lot, I, I, I do a storytelling slam, a kind of informal contest. Uh, at a bar in Delray Beach, the, the town north. I do all kinds of things in the community. I also, and that's what this is, um, I also do a lot of, I don't know which way that went around, I also do a lot of work of outreach in the university. So I have been a really nice uh, shlicha for my department, my now School of Communication. This CD is a uh, I went into the studio, we have, a, we have a recording studio at the school. I um, went in and recorded this. It was a performance I did for the 40th anniversary of our university, a very, very new university. And I uh, went to the president's office and suggested that I do something as a culmination of the year, of the 40th anniversary year. And so they made an event. It was funny, somebody afterwards said, oh, your performance just made the event. I said, you don't know how much that's true. They, they created an event for me to, at the president's mansion to do this performance. And the performance was based on interviews with all the people who had been around since the founding of the university. So they talked about what, what the university was like. People talked to me. The university, where our university is, used to be an army base. 
radar, in fact, was developed at that base, which is why the show is called Radar. And uh, so we talked about, I talked about that. I went further back, and, and I, I did a tell. My, my Jewish studies work came in handy, and my reading of the source came in handy. I called it a tell. So we started at Adam and Eve, and then and, and the early Native Americans who were on that site, and then I went to the Army base, and then I went to the university, and we kind of, we kind of built the thing. So, and you can look inside on the, on the, um, the uh, thing inside, there's information about, there was a professor, the chair of the music department also did music for that, the piano work. So that was just one way in which I've been able to be a shlicha. I also do many seminars for, uh, not only in my school, but also for the School of Nursing, for the School of Business, uh, for library science students, for many students within the university as well. Uh, I've been able in this way to create a very unusual bond with the president. In fact, when I, this is a 25,000 student university, so it's unusual for an artist in residence to have a really close Kesha with the president and his wife, but because I've, been, I've had a high profile, this has happened to the point where I hosted a storytelling series last spring at a a very nice theater, 300 seat theater in Boca Raton, which I will now be doing every year. I also do one that's a little bit less fancy at a community center. The president and his wife hosted the opening reception. So I'm telling you this because it just created a really great profile for this, helped create, I mean our school has a very good profile already, but helped create for the School of Communication a very good profile because it's something unusual that then they could show off to donors and to everybody else. So it was, it was an interesting kind of mix of the scholarship and the community action and, and, and the, the fundraising that they needed to do. So I think I'm going to stop there. That's my job. And that's what storytelling studies is. That's what storytelling is. And that's who I am. And um, gee, I'd love to end with a story, but I think I'll take your questions first. I hope that was useful to you. And uh, does, does anyone have comments, questions? Yes. Excuse me? Who are the students who take these classes? Who are the students? Where are they coming from? Uh, many are in the School of Communication. Most of them are in the School of Communication. Most are undergraduates. They may be studying film. They may be studying intercultural communication. They may be studying uh, conflict and communication and, and other things. But um, they come in here because storytelling is so uh, useful for any of those of those areas so this is a very good adjunct to what their to what their their main uh, their major is I also have some nursing students as I said there is a strong uh, uh, connection between storytelling and healing uh, I've had some criminology students I've had theater students English students I've education students I've had education students absolutely no question um, but primarily, I go to the School of Education and teach that and do lectures there, and I've done that quite a bit. You know, I do workshops there, absolutely. Uh, primarily, um, for better or for worse, <coughs> with, um, elementary school education, edu uh, education, but also people who are doing high school work to go into high schools, etc. A lot of them. Yes? How is digital media um, kind of advancements in, in terms of the way that we can tell stories, how has it kind of ex affected your discipline? Um, has it, does it change what story, I mean, I, I know that it changes what storytelling is, but how so? And do you incorporate that into what you do? I am not the best person to speak to that point only because I am a technophobe, I think that's partly why I went into storytelling, but there is a person on our board who is extremely interested in that, and she wrote a paper, it might be in the purple copy, otherwise I can send you uh, the paper that was in, in the, one of our issues about that. There are quite a few people who do either online learning, I know that's not what you're talking about, but do online learning with storytelling, it sounds a little strange, but somehow it works, I wouldn't want to do that myself, but it does work. But there is a lot about virtual storytelling. It does expand that definition I gave you at the beginning of my talk. 
certainly, uh, because people are not face to face, but in our virtual world, they are sharing space in our virtual world. And there are people who do quite a bit of that work. And what about pictorial storytelling? Uh, there is, in fact, we used to have at our school an MFA who was doing pictorial animation storytelling, animated storytelling online, and had a website, which I can get for you. I think I recall it, but I'll check it just to be sure. He did beautiful work. Unfortunately, he left to go back and get a PhD. So I, I started working with him, and then he left the program. But it is a growing field. Is this something you could see using in your classes? You could see bringing in somebody to address your classes? Or would you like to know more about what would go on in a class? Yeah, give us an example. It would help me. Mm -hmm. you give us an example of the story that you would use and how you would shape a class that would uh, use this medium in the most effective way. I think I will tell what I did. I'll tell you what I did at um, Midrash at um, Lindabam the other day. Oh, well, yeah, actually, you were there, so I won't tell you that. I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you what Nobody I did. Else will say. No, 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 no I'll, but this, uh, but that's all right. I'll tell you, and he probably heard. He wasn't listening. He was asleep anyway. Uh, no, no, I don't. Well, well, you can learn something else. You could hear something else. Um, I'll tell you about what I did with the ninth graders yesterday. These were native English speakers or students learning English. And I came in and the first thing I did was I told them the following story. There was once a king who loved stories so much that he hated for them to end. So he issued a proclamation. He said anybody who could tell him a story that didn't end would win a bag of gold. The wise men and women tried and failed, and then a poor young storyteller came to town. And she said, I can do it. The wise men and women laughed and laughed, but the king said, give her a chance. And the poor young storyteller said, there once was a king who loved stories so much that he hated for them to end. So he issued a proclamation. Anybody who could tell him a story that had no end would win a bag of gold. The wise men and women tried and failed, but then a po I'll stop. So I went over that because you got it much faster than they did. Uh, thank goodness. So I did that a few times, and they laughed. And then I said, you know, um, we all love stories. And the reason we love stories is because our earliest education came from storytelling. In fact, the earliest education from, of the human, uh, uh, the human race came through story, perhaps. But certainly, among uh, uh, us as individuals, we were taught, we were socialized through story. We have wonderful memories, most of us, of our parents telling us stories, maybe holding us while they told stories. Or we have, we have good associations with story. We experience life through story. We organize experience through stories, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, what I'm going to do, we talked a little bit about that. We went over what is a story, not with the, um, the rubric that I used here, but with just beginning, middle, and an end. And in the beginning, there are characters and setting, and middle, there's a problem. At the end, there's a resolution just about that or an image that is scratched. There's also a surprise at the end. There's also some sort of transformation at the end, et cetera. Then I told them I was going to tell them a story. And at two points in the story, I would stop and I would ask them to brainstorm and then demonstrate through a skit, through a story, through a dance, through a, anything they wanted. Of course, they didn't do dance. A song, they could demonstrate the alternatives they felt the hero or the main characters could take in the story. And here's the story. It's a, it's a West African story. There are once two sisters who were very, very close. Now you may ask, how close were they? You may ask, how, how close were they? Thank you very much. They were so close that they didn't disagree, they didn't argue, and they didn't even fight. Just like you and your siblings, correct? Just like all of us. 
Well, when it came time for these girls to marry, they found themselves two brothers. And these brothers were very, very close. How close were they? Thank you so much. You may ask. <laughs> you may well ask. They were so close that not only did they, didn't, did they never fight, not only did they never argue, but they never even disagreed. Now, the two couples settled on adjacent farms that were separated by a slender strip of road. And on those farms, they grew yams. Yams being the main crop of this village. In fact, yams were so important to this village that every year since the brothers and sisters had been young, there was a yam contest in the village mm -hmm. to determine who had the sweetest, the most golden, and the most delicious yams. And every year, a little man named Kofi won that contest. He had the sweetest, the most golden, and the most delicious yams. Were you out for a second? Okay, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to uh, make you uncomfortable. And how dare you? No, I don't mean that. It's just what I did was, at this point, two people came in late. And so I asked the students to bring, her up, to bring the people who came in late up to date on where we were. And it was exactly at that point, which is really the share. So, uh, so I, I, if you don't mind, I won't do that this time, unless you'd like me to. But they, they brought, what happened, there were two, two husbands, two wives, they were brothers and sisters, they were very, very close. And they lived on, a, on farms that were separated by a road, and there was a yam contest, they grew yams, and the yams were very important in this town, there was a yam contest. Okay, so I had somebody repeat everything that, that just happened. Okay. So they grew yams, and Kofi won this contest every single year. He won the first year, he won the year after that, and 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 the year after that. Well, one night at supper, as the brothers and sisters, which the brothers and sisters shared together, uh, as, uh, as they always did, one of the brothers said, you know, I think I know how we can win that yam contest this year. Well, tell us, tell us. I stopped the story there. I had the students talk among themselves, in small groups, groups of three or four. I had them talk, there were 40-something students, so I had them talk, there were about 10 groups, 10, 12 groups. I had them talk about what they would do. Of course, the same eight students answered all of my questions. But somebody got up and they did a little skit, and I think, um, I'm trying to think what they came up with. I think they were going to paint their yam golden and put sugar on it to make it sweet. And somebody else was going to steal Kofi's yams. You know, I said, think out of the box. And of course, they thought out of the box. And I said, it doesn't have to be legal. It can be anything you want. Use your imagination. And, uh, and so uh, they came up with things. And then I went on with the story. The brother said, for the next year, if we combine all of our resources, if we work together and we share seeds and we share insulas and we share everything together, maybe we can win that contest. So for a year, that's what they did. They worked with their two farms separated by that slender strip of road. They worked as if those two farms were one. And at the end of the year, who do you think had the sweetest, the most golden, and the most delicious yams? Coffee. Well, you are right, and most people, most people, I mean, you are, excuse me, you are wrong. Most people say that, and most people are so cynical, it, cynical, it is very painful to know how cynical uh, my audiences are. No, the brothers and the sisters, ha, I'll give you another chance. The brothers and the sisters, they had the sweetest, the most golden, and the most delicious yams. Four, and they won the contest. Four. Three days, for three nights, everybody in the village celebrated. They ate, they drank, they made merry. Everybody but one person, and that person was oh, There you got it. For three days and three nights, Coffee paced up and down his room, trying to figure out what he could do to win that yam contest for the next year and every year from then on and from night 
the third night, just before dawn of the fourth morning, it came to him. And then I stop, and I uh, stopped, and I asked the students to do this again. Of course, it wasn't a very different assignment, but to think, you know, what would what would Kofi do? I got murder. I got, of course, I got murder. I got threatening with guns. I, okay, of course, I got all kinds of things. I allowed everything. I made no value judgments. So this was brainstorming and play for them, and just you know, better that they get this out in their in their play in their imagination, which is something that a uh, Bruno Bettelheim, psychoanalyst, uh, said in the '70s. Although he has been discredited, of course, you know, many in many of the things he had to say. Anyhow. I came back, we came back, we reconvened afterwards, and I told them the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is that just before dawn, on the fourth morning, Kofi made himself a hat. It was a traditional hat called a fila. And the fila is bell-shaped. And his fila was different from anybody else's. On, I know some of you are way, way ahead of me on this. On one side of the fila, the material, the homer, was scarlet, satin. On the other side of the fila, the material was midnight velvet, black velvet. He put the fila on his head in the fourth morning when the couples were back on their farms separated by the slender strip of road. He put on his hat and he walked down that road looking neither left nor right. Just walked down the road and left. what storytellers do for suspense. <laughs> I don't want to leave you in suspense. So that night, the brothers and sisters got together to have their evening meal. And one of the brothers happened to say, gee, mm -hmm. wonder what Kofi was doing walking down our road today. And the other one said, yeah, I don't know, but that was sure a beautiful scarlet satin fila. Mm -hmm. And the sister said, Dear brother, perhaps the morning sun was in your eyes, but that was a midnight velvet fila. Dear sister, perhaps you had had a little too much to drink or to eat the night before, the, over these last three days of celebration. It was scarlet satin, midnight velvet, scarlet satin, midnight velvet, scarlet satin, midnight, and on we've gone and on and on, and they're screaming, and that night they separated without saying anything. A year passed. They didn't eat together anymore. They didn't work together anymore. Mm -hmm. And who do you think, at the end of the year, had the sweetest, the most golden, and the most delicious yams? Mm -hmm. And who do you think, at the end of the year, and the sweetest, <laughs> the most golden, and you know what this is like, and the most delicious yams. Oh, and he won the yam contest that year, and the year after that, 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 and the year after that. And that's the story of Kofi's hat. So then I finished the story, and we talked about why that, what was useful to them about that, that when you tell stories, and when you do in your head what I had them do concretely um, with, uh, with the, or not so concretely, but what, what I had them do with um, uh, the skits, you are examining, you can imagine alternatives. You're exercising your imagination, just like you're working out, exercising your body. You are exercising your imagination and thereby able to, um, to use your imagination when it comes to imagining alternatives in your schoolwork if you're writing a paper, if you're answering a test, or in your life. Maybe your parents did one thing, maybe you want to do something else. If you have an imagination, you are able to think in, in outside of the box. Uh, I also very, very briefly talked about the fact that, um, actually I didn't, do, I did this with Linda Baum, but this is probably useful to you. I didn't do this that, with that group. Um, I was talking to uh, Aura about this earlier today. Um, people who study the, the effect of, and I'm just, some of you may be very familiar with this, the effect of presentations on listeners, what people retain from that, uh, what percentage of what they get do they actually retain. Um, generally, people um, retain, audience retains, what you're going to retain from what I 
did today is 55% visual. My math is so bad, I always have to think about this for a minute. 38% tone and a lousy 7% content. Or I said that she had heard 8. A lousy 7, 8% content. Now, uh, I confirmed with her before I say this to you, but this is what I generally say, that if I am indeed telling you a story and you are getting then concrete images, because I'm not transmitting words to you, I'm transmitting images. As I tell you the story, it, my words are different every time, I am a, a movie is running in my head and I am transmitting those images to me, from me to you. 97% of the population receives visual images, so I am transferring visual stuff to you. So you are not only, theoretically, getting 7% of the content, but you are getting 55% of the visual if you are indeed getting these 55, this 55% uh, these uh, visual images. Anyway, with the class yesterday morning, we wound up by talking about how useful it is for them to pay attention to the stories in their life, for them to exercise their imaginations. I said that I personally would not uh, condone much of their responses for those uh, for their alternatives that they that they wanted to use for ways for Kofi and the brothers and sisters to win the contest, but that the pleasure and the importance of storytelling is that they can brainstorm those things. They can play them out. Um, because narrative is highly ethical, and when I used to go into philosophy of, of that discipline with respect to storytelling studies, I talk about the inherent ethical quality of storytelling, cause and effect, responsibility, actions have consequences, uh, sequential, uh, the sequential elements. Uh, so, that, so they can see, well, maybe hitting the person over the head is not the best thing to do. Maybe killing the person is not the best thing to do because of X, Y, Z. So that's my, that's what I did with them. And that, it, it was a very interesting session, and I think they got something from it. So we're almost done. Any other questions? I don't want to keep you. We have time for both. Oh, One good. question or comment. I'd love to hear your responses to this work. Was, did it, was it valuable to you? Was it worthwhile to you? Is there any way you think? Either I can do that to use this week, or you might want to find out more about some area. I'd be delighted to, to talk to you. Yes? Do you use storifying content content matter in, in I mean, let's say, how he wants to teach Bible. Uh, would you storify the Bible, or, or you use story to teach imagination and, and um, I just want to see from those two things. Well, the Bible, of course, has so many well, stories story. in it already right. that, that's a, that that's kind of a no-brainer, that it works wonderfully. Uh, these books, which I will leave around here as long as I get them back when I go, uh, these are two books that deal with exactly that. And I, in fact, I have Kofi's hat in this one, uh, how I use Kofi's hat with um, people who, uh, in a program I did with uh, people who were getting their high school equivalency exam, they were in a program, they were, they were uh, juvenile offenders who had come out of prison and were doing a, a program because it was in Miami. But this is a lot of, uh, of how, that was a character education class, which of course is used a lot in. Um, this will give a lot of answers to that, as will <coughs> this. This is the use of story in science classes and math classes, mm -hmm. etc. And yeah, the thing about story, and this is um, more general storytelling organizations and storytelling generally, uh, how storytelling persuades. Uh, essentially, what we say is that storytelling um, always uses more or less, always uses some kind of emotion. There's always some kind of emotion within the story. And we have to have that in order to care, and that's what caring is, in order to care about the main character, in order to care about this crisis, this uh, conflict. And um, uh, Plato said, and I always tell my students, he didn't actually say this to me, but Plato said, mm -hmm. uh, as we, they're always shocked, as we love, so we learn. As our emotions are kindled toward the uh, toward our teacher and toward and th thus to the subject matter, we we have a, a greater connection to the material. And um, 
I'm sure you've all seen that uh, to some extent in your classes. And storytelling also, it has been shown, storytelling promotes memory as well. Uh, it certainly bonds a class together, not only a teacher with a student, but students with, um, um, among themselves. I see uh, in evaluations, students will, come, will always tell me, I've never felt this way in a class. I've never uh, known my fellow students like I have, or known my professor for that matter, like I have in this class. So there are, but, so to answer your question, a long way, kind of derech agav, but also directly, <coughs> There are many ways. Um, in, in one of the instances, the person I interviewed, Kendall Haven, who's done a lit review of all the, the uh, studies in, uh, in uh, storytelling education, one example he uses is uh, somebody was teaching a science class. How did this go? Um, she, al oh, she always taught, you know, it's just left me. <laughs> she always taught something. It may come back to me. Uh, uh, it will probably come back to me the minute we finish here. She'd always taught something every year, and students, one particular fact, and students always got it wrong. So the difference between X and Y, I don't remember what it was. They always got it wrong in this, in this test. <coughs> so one year, she told stories. It may have had something to do with Darwin, I don't remember. She told stories about this character or in the guise of this character, as this character, I forget how she did it. And she followed through and saw that that class which she did this, everybody got that question right. Why? They got the visual images, they got the emotional connection, they got all of the stuff that we've been talking about. So it seems to work beautifully well with science, with math, certainly with history, with Bible, with any of those other things. It's useful. I don't mean 100% about the class, but I just mean there are ways to incorporate narrative. Um, a any other questions, or I'll, I'll just want to say yes. Montar de hybrid. Excuse me. Ani yehola le daber de hybrid. Ani yehoshav et shakai ulai. Ani yadat shat yehola. Divart al projektim shatem osim shekshurim le social action be le conflict resolution. De chashat ulai ke sapri lanu vetzara al lechad me projektim. And I can connect that to what I was going to say. That was so gratifying. Thank you. I wouldn't have been able to answer that a week ago, but it's coming back to me. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, my students do a tremendous amount of social, of um, what we call service learning. And I was talking to Michael uh, Gross about this a little bit this morning, how much of a component of your program that is. And I, from what I hear, very little. It's hugely popular in high schools and in colleges and universities and states. And I've seen this discussed at conferences all over the internet, and I'm happy to give you material about this. Many of your students, of course, do student teaching, so it's not that relevant. But our students, for part of their grade, it might be, I don't know, 20%, uh, uh, it might be less or more, they use the skills and theory that they've learned in the class, they use in the community. And of course, because social action, community involvement, civic engagement is so important to me personally, and because I want to demonstrate how social action is, how a storytelling is useful with respect to social action, my students almost across the board do that work. Uh, they do it in their basic story, well, actually, in basic storytelling, in storytelling for peace and conflict, and they just started doing it in the intergenerational class as well. So I will have students go, for example, there is an African American library where uh, young black children of uh, usually lower, low socioeconomic level come for after school programs. I had students come and do kind of what I just did with you with the Kofi story and then talking about tolerance and working together and how if you work together you do better than you work <coughs> apart and how easy it is to break people apart, et cetera and about perspective, and, and uh, that, that there's more than one uh, truth in, every, in, in most situations. And so I may have them do a program like that. This last semester, I observed, uh, service learning takes a lot of time in the part of the instructor, of course, because you want to observe. I had a grad student observe a couple, but I observed a lot of my students doing this work, sometimes in the groups and the settings in which I work already, so it was easy. But I had them do that work in the community. I had them go into senior, the senior center where I work 
um, the elderly in South Florida have a lot, I don't know if this is the same here, have a lot of tension, a lot of conflict in their lives between with each other and with younger people. So we thought it would be useful for them to do conflict work in that case. So what they would do, oh, the last part of what I did with the students yesterday, I forgot it because it was a very little part of it, is that they then took the themes from the Kofi's hat story and they applied, they looked for stories in their own lives. <coughs> and one or two of them told, I told a personal story based on those themes and they did as well. So that's a lot of what they do, in, what my students do. They first will tell uh, a folk tale, they will, uh, they will have the group identify themes from the folk tale, and then the students will connect episodes in their own lives with the folk tale and with those themes and will come up with their own alternative. Sometimes I will have, I will do something based on, and, and I will not go into this in detail right now, but if you'd like to hear about it later, uh, there's a technique that's been used throughout the world, some of you may have heard of, for the last 30 years called playback theater, uh, which I was trained just for one day, and it's actually a four-day training uh, uh, session, where people act out people's stories, but with different interpretations, different endings, etc. So it gives people a different perspective on their stories, so sometimes they do have them as well. Does that answer your question? Okay. So in, in a summation, I could talk for 24 hours about the use of storytelling in the community, in the school, and how useful it is uh, in education. I would be delighted. I'm not here to, uh, uh, to tour. I'm here to work. It is my great pleasure to talk about this with you. And I thank you again for making me feel so comfortable here. Anything that I can do to be of service, I would be delighted. And I thank you for your time, and I honor you for what you are doing here at Melton. I am extremely impressed with the work that you are doing with the caliber of the faculty and with, in general, with, with how you approach education and what I've seen. So I thank you for the work that you do as well. Yes, I. I really want to know who's happy, you or the kids? <laughs> Who has a better time in class? It's a hard one. <laughs> you know, that's the first question that has stumped me. Okay. <laughs> I will have to get, to get back to you on that. I feel blessed every day of my life for what I do, and I certainly didn't before I did this work. It is. I work around the clock. Um, I, they did a, a, an article on me in the local paper, and they started with, uh, they, I get a lot of stuff in the press, but they started with the fact that I told the, the reporter that I put my office key into my front door of my house and my house key into the front door of my office because there is no separation between the two. I work all the time. I don't need to work all the time, but I am really, um, passionate about what I do. I don't know if that came through in the last uh, hour that we've been talking, but it is, it's a very difficult question to, to answer because I, as enervating as it is, it is more energizing to do this work. And uh, I am very happy to do it. And I love kind of kind of giving that bug to other people because the storytellers have that look in our eye that, uh, and we also tend to be evangelical about what we do as well because we love to pass on uh, this work to others. So I thank you for your attention. It wasn't really a question, Karen, it was a comment. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Karen. I think it's very rich and very diverse. And first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call my brother and see what's happened to our young girl. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>